Hello, how are you doing? Good. Uh, part two of our yes. action-packed two-part episode uh, in reverse chronological order. <laughs> so we just had an interview with Sandy for episode 341, and now we're going to do 340. Werner yes. von Braun. Um, so if you have stumbled into this and you have no idea what this is, you are watching a live episode of our long-running... Ep- no, I was going to say award-winning, but we haven't. No. No. Our, award our, nominated. Award, nomi- award nominated many times. Our long-running award nominated uh, astronomy cast. Uh, so uh, if you want, you can uh, interact with us. You can ask us some questions using the Q&A app. So if you're watching this video somewhere on YouTube, wherever, it'll say be part of the conversation. Click to join live Q&A on Google Plus Hangout. So if you do that, then you'll see a little place where you can put in some questions, and I will monitor them as we go. Uh, Noel Rupenthal says, uh, Werner von Kerman, I mean Braun, too much KSP for me. So check this out, Noel. <laughs> How awesome is this, right? Where did you get that? From the Kerbal Space Program. They uh, they know I'm a huge fan, and they sent me a, uh, a little Kerbal Space Program space shuttle. So uh, how cool is that? Seven, maybe 12? Super cool. Um, uh, we actually used it as a um, for a video that we did. We brought it in to to demonstrate uh, why galaxies have arms, which I know you're wondering. We were talking about if there was a crashed alien saucer, then on the side of the road, then cars would uh, would slow down and then speed up as they went past to gape slack jawed at the uh, crashed alien saucer, which and is so, entirely true and, and does actually work with spiral arm formation. And so this was our crashed alien saucer, and the cars are the uh, stars falling into the density wave. Um, uh, Guido Bieber says this one should have Amy Sure title as a guest. Uh, Amy Sure title is not allowed to do anything that isn't writing her book. So there is no way I'm going to distract her from her writing, from her work. She's got so much work to do. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. All right, let's get rolling. Uh, you ready to record? Yep, I am pressing record. It is recording. It is mono. Life is good. My levels are better than last week. So we're happy. I'm happy. Right. I don't know if you're happy. I, I'm. If you're happy, I'm happy. Okay, Preston. We hope you're happy too. <laughs> Hi, Preston. Uh, sorry for all the weird, confusing, mixed-up audio we're sending at you. Um, we thank you in advance. All right, here we go. Astronomy Cast episode three forty. The what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get very far. <laughs> That's it. <clears throat> we're done. All right, let me try again. Astronomy Cast episode three forty. Werner von Braun. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. It's time for another reminder for the hangout a thon on about to happen in a April 26 27 and we're still doing lots of organization um, yeah come prepare to support us in our insanity in our desire to do science we will do almost anything that is legal <gasps> right on um, I <laughs> I got <get> nothing <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to move on to my intro. Um, all right. Uh, so, hey, when the United States helped defeat Germany at the end of World War II, they acquired the German rocket scientist Werner von Braun. He had already developed the German V-2 rocket program and went on to design all the major hardware of the U.S. rocket program. This week, we talk about von Braun's life and accomplishments. Uh, cool. So, uh, man, where to start? So, so... I do. I I hope that most people who are fascinated about space and the the whole the Apollo missions and the Gemini program and the Mercury program and all of that are aware of von Braun's uh, influence involvement. But for those who don't, I mean, who was this guy? I uh, put simply, he has been described as one of the most 
uh, controversial, uh, one of the people who history has been rewritten around the most in terms of rocket science. He uh, came from Germany, he came from actually uh, the aristocracy, uh, the Vaughn part is because his, his father was the moral equivalent of a baron. Uh, had had the type of upbringing where he went from boarding school to boarding school, went to university, uh, got himself in and out of interesting problems regarding uh, rockets. He, he got a telescope as a child, uh, got extremely interested in it, and kind of like me, just kind of didn't get uninterested. But for him, rockets were the cool part, and he, for instance, was kind of collared by the police when he was young because he took a wagon and attached a bunch of fireworks to it trying to recreate some of the rocket cars he'd read about. Um, he went to university so cool. studied mechanical engineering. Uh, no, you do not need a PhD in astrophysics to work in, in the space race. Honestly, go get a degree in mechanical engineering. You'll get a job, unlike the rest of us. Um, oh. Well, it's, it's true. No, I know. Um, I know. <laughs> and if, if that doesn't work out, you can always design uh, HVAC systems for buildings. Yes, or bridges. Or bridges. Um, so, so he was really inspired. I, I love the tale of how his life grew. He got a telescope that got him going. He was doing kind of bad in math and science in school, and he got his hands on a book, uh, Die Rakete zu den Planetarumen. Um, my German teacher is getting ready to throw things at me. Um, translated, it's by rocket into interplanetary space. And um, it was a book by Hermann Obreth, who became um, von Brahms' hero and then eventually his mentor as he started to actually work on his PhD, get involved in doing science and rocketry and engineering. And all of this was occurring between the world wars. Um, unfortunately, um, after Hitler took power, his life started to enter the land of the truth depends on who you're reading because history is written by the people who won and researched it. Um, and the research is sometimes meant to meet agendas. So, I mean, you're sort of insinuating there, there are sort of two stories here on, <clears throat> on von Braun's involvement in Nazi Germany and, and was he a card-carrying well, member that, of the Nazi party or was, was he... That's not to be okay. controverted. I'm not sure how to conjugate that. So I, I think it's not just two stories. I think it's three stories. Um, extremist story A is... He was cool with the Nazis. He hung out. He wore his SS uniform whenever he needed to, showed up to meetings. Um, so that's one extreme. The other extreme, and, and part of that extreme, which we'll get to later, is that it was he who was purposely sabotaging the V2 program to prevent it from advancing as quickly as it could have. The other side of that is he really didn't like any of this. He was just a scientist, wasn't into politics. He realized if he paid his dues for the Nazi party, things would go easier for him. He only once ever wore his SS uniform, and it's for the only picture taken of him in the SS uniform. Um, and in that argument, um, he was simply someone who just wanted to do his science, just wanted, to, didn't care, kind of disliked all of this. Um, and then what I suspect is true is the truth was in the middle. He was someone who just wanted to build rockets, didn't care about politics so much, but hey, if the Nazis would pay for him to build rockets, he was going to build rockets. Like many other people in Germany at the time, he was witness to atrocities that he realized he couldn't do anything about. He didn't do anything to purposely stop them, didn't do anything to purposely cause them. And in some ways you can argue that's as bad. Um, but I think that's the natural human response. Um, so there, there's three stories in there and what you find when you read is nuanced by the fact that there are angry people who want to make anyone who ever carried a Nazi or an SS membership card into an evil demon. 
And it's also nuanced by the fact that he and 150 other roughly German scientists were brought to America as part of Project Paperclip. They were stuck on a military base. Their arrival in America was kept secret for five months, basically. And during that time, the US Army expunged all records of their involvement in Nazi Germany. Yeah, and I mean, I know that like when uh, like when Berlin was taken, when Germany surrendered, the the rocket program was split up, right, between the Americans and the, the then the Russians, eventually the Soviets, and so some of the people who had been working on the program were participating in the Soviet program, and others were participating in the U.S. program. And I guess fortunately for the Americans, von Braun came to to the U.S. And, and largely that's due to aid from his brother and the fact that Werner von Braun really wanted to come to America. Um, he was concerned about the harsh working environments that he'd heard about in Soviet Russia where the scientists were basically being pushed in essentially work camps was the way it sounded. Um, and um, I ironically at one point towards the end of World War II he'd been arrested and held held prisoner for two weeks um, and one of the claims against him was that he had communist sympathies but as he saw his nation falling as the Allied troops pushed further and further into central Germany um, he managed to get his team distributed through villages uh, in what they hoped would be the path of the Americans and when his brother um, according to some reports saw uh, an American soldier, his brother on a bicycle called out in broken English uh, that they wanted to surrender and got them surrendered into the hands of the Americans. Wow. Okay, so so I mean, specifically, he was really involved in, as, as the war went, with the V2 program. And these were these these missiles. Have you seen one in... in yeah, there's one down at the Smithsonian, yeah. and I believe there's yeah there is one. I saw one in Germany as well. Yeah, there's one at the Huntsville Space and Rocket Center where Space Camp is. Um, yeah, so so he wasn't he wasn't just that rocket. It it was he was working on rockets as as part of his research program. I mean, this, this guy was a researcher prior to getting sucked into the war effort. Um, so he was he starting in 1931 was part of the German Space Flight Society. Uh, he was working on the Repulsor series of rockets. Um, he uh, was one of the first to develop. It was tiny. It was only about two foot, two thirds of a meter long. Uh, it was called the Hunkel Wickler One. Um, that was developed with him and another German scientist and launched in 31. Um, so, so they were working on these early rockets um, in the 30s. Um, he he started working on that actually before he finished his bachelor's degree. Um, in 32, he was working on artillery, um, kind of because he had to because it was 32. Um, he earned his PhD in 34 after Hitler had come to power. And that was when he also ended up having to start on the A rockets. These were the aggregate one rockets. They used a couple different tanks. They had a gyroscope in their nose. And this is actually where he started using ethanol along with liquid oxygen um, as a rocket fuel. Um, rumor has it when things launched correctly, they drank some of the ethanol. Um, so, so there were two A2 rockets, Max and Moritz, that were successfully launched in December of 34, um, and they climbed to an altitude of about 6,500 feet. And this was where things really started pushing to get him doing missiles. And so in 37, um, there was the new Kummelsdorf, uh, liquid fuel rocket and guided missile center that he got put at um, is located on the Baltic Sea and he was the technical director from then until the end of the war and this was where they started working on the V2s this was um, a project that used basically slave labor that um, hideous working environments um, it was oh, a really 
chemicals that they were dealing with. I mean, it's just a, it was an awful situation. Yeah, and and it was essentially a work camp for aeronautical work, and. Um, the V2 plant was named Mittelwerk. You can look up some of the atrocities from there. It wasn't good. There were more than 60,000 prisoners used to construct missiles, and 25,000 of them died. Wow. So rough. So more than a third of the people involved died building these rockets. That's amazing to me that that such a technical, complicated precision project and they were they were just doing it with with slave labor I mean but but think of the people they'd enslaved these were often very well educated Jews yeah so you take a well educated workforce threaten to kill them beat them starve yep. them while they kill were their families them. yeah yeah no good good point that's uh, man so oh, it's just awful so let's get to the part where where the war <laughs> ended. I guess so. They tested they tested the V two and then they they did these, fire these were a the couple. The right? rockets. Yeah. There's so there was a V two um, test launch that uh, was and this is was formerly the A four. So they went from A four to V two. Um, and these were again alcohol liquid to oxygen rockets. Um, there were forty six tall forty six feet tall rockets. These were babies. But um, they reach speeds of 3,500 miles per hour with a maximum range of about 200 miles. And when you start to think that you can see from France to England, that's terrifying. Yeah, this was a this was a gigantic leap uh, forward uh, with using this kind of technology because up until this point, like with the V ones, which yeah. were the, which were like you were airplanes were you know you could jet planes you could stop them because yeah, they were flying and towards England and then you would hit the engine and stop fuzzy. and they would yeah and they would crash but these things yeah. they were on a you know they were on an arc they would just launch up they would follow a trajectory and then they would just come straight down and at the same time the Germans were working on a nuclear program and so can you just imagine that if they had Put these things, these two things together, and were raining nuclear bombs down on. And there on were huge countries. numbers of these built. Yeah. Um, the first successful launch was in 1942, and it wasn't due to quite often sabotage from the workforce. Um, and this is where you start to hit the controversy of the good Warner von Braun encouraged the sabotage because he didn't want to bomb England, and the bad Warner von Braun. Um, didn't want anything to do with the sabotage because he wanted his rockets to fly and the truth is probably in the middle. Um, but it was in 1944 that the the bombings started. Um, it, it was September 8th, 1944 uh, at 11 a.m. Six people were killed, three dozen were injured. Seven hours later there was a second um, this is all happening in London, and over the next few months, 3,000 rockets were launched. Oh, there yeah. were more V2s than all the other rockets since then combined. And 1,358 missiles struck London alone. Wow. All right, well, so let's let's move on then. So, I mean, that's the V2 program, and it's just you know it was devastating and there was no way to stop it that yeah. and uh, and so then the Americans and the Soviets or the Russians yeah. and the Allies retake Berlin and as you said they captured a bunch of the the rocket scientists yeah. and he had a team of 500 right and brought them back to the United States and so then what happened then what ha sort of what happened from so the, so from in the... in June of 1945 um, the U.S. Army held pretty much 150 of his team. It may have been all the way up to 500 members of his team. I couldn't find accurate numbers on that um, at an interrogation camp in Bavaria. And as they checked out who was who, who was useful, um, 150 of those scientists were selected to come to America. Um, they were transferred to the United States. They were confined to an island base in basically Boston Harbor, 
while their records were expunged. Uh, history was rewritten so that if anyone with the records of the time looked into the background of these scientists, they wouldn't learn the Nazi party affiliations, the SS part, the SS affiliations. Um, and so they brought them to America and then resettled them. Uh, Von Braum went to Fort Bliss, Texas and began working on the US ballistic program. Um, in the 1950s we didn't have NASA. That's one of those things that people often forget. Um, so he served as, Warner Von Braun served as project director and um, it was called the sub office for rockets and it wasn't just him and his scientists. There were also a number of V2 rockets that were captured, I guess is the right word, that were brought to America. Um, and there were a lot of test firings and improvements that all happened out at White, Stan White Sands Missile Arsenal in New Mexico. And according to some stories that I heard while I was at space camp as a teenager, and this is, um, it, it fits in with the stories of why he got arrested during World War II, Werner von Braun just wanted to go to space. He, he just wanted to send humans to space, to get to Mars. And there was during World War II a party where apparently he got a bit intoxicated and said that he didn't think that Germany was going to turn out well in this war and he just wanted to launch humans into space. And this was basically a treasonous act. It's why he was thrown into prison for two weeks. Eventually um, a bunch of people said, look, Hitler, we need him out of jail. We need his rockets. Um, so he was he was selected as too important and so he was able to get away with treasonous statements. Well, the guy's brought to America and the exact same thing happens. He's told, build deadly missiles. And the, the story I heard from one of his junior scientists who, who'd come to America and at that point was at Redstone Missile Arsenal at Huntsville Space and Rocket Center. Um, he said that Werner von Braun was always working on, okay, so we're stuck building these ballistic missiles. But you know that's the same thing as a low orbiting rocket. And so he was building everything with the ability to add a human capsule to the top. And in, in 1950 he and his team were transferred to Redstone Missile Arsenal in Huntsville where he was the director of the guided uh, missile and development program at the arsenal. Um, they were working on the Redstone rocket program. On the side, he was working on things like designing space stations, as one does. Um, and so when we finally started to realize, thanks to the Soviets launching humans, the oh, expletive, we should be launching humans, um, and they started trying to figure out how do we add a capsule to the top of the Redstone missiles. And according to the scientist who was speaking when I was at space camp, they'd actually been working on human capsules and whenever bigwigs came to inspect their facility, they stuck these capsules on a raft and floated them down a river and hid them in a farmer's barn. And I actually pulled up maps of Redstone and it looks like it could be plausible. There's a river there, there right. there's no reason this couldn't be true. And so when when folks came to them and said we need to launch humans they were essentially ready to go which is why we were able to so quickly go from nothing to we had the Jupiter seas we we had all of these things uh, such that we we started being able to launch humans satellites all of that into space in in the 60s um, with 61 being the Saturn 1 rocket, uh, and then of course the Saturn 5. And so it was him, these 150 German scientists, and the Americans they brought along for the ride. And he was the head of this program all the way up through the late 60s into the early 70s when he died of pancreatic cancer. And so, I mean, when we talk about the all of, you know, you said that he came over to the U.S. and started to do essentially the same thing, build rockets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for killing and and so again we still have the same dichotomy right where you've got this situation yeah. where you've got these but now they're not they don't have 200 kilometers range they can drop a missile tens 10,000 kilometers yeah. away 
and and carrying a nuclear warhead. So I mean that that Hitler's wish is now true. That yeah, he spent 12 years in America designing ballistic missiles before NASA was finally formed in 1958. Yeah, that 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 what Hitler, you know, was working towards the United States and the Soviets yeah. finished off, which is a ballistic missile, an intercontinental ballistic missile capable of dropping a multi-megaton warhead on a on a target, and that's you know, so it's I mean, we as space nerds are so excited about. The, the 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 flight side of it but this is all just done under this i don't know like under this umbrella it's of the, same the most elaborate killing machine that's that has ever been conceived and, and still kind of hangs over our heads today so yeah this is a story that gets repeated it we didn't know about adaptive optics for telescopes despite their existence and their ability to be applied to astronomy until the Challenger explosion where some of the adaptive optics images were accidentally released. Um, there's so many GPS. times. Yeah. You know? The military has vast budgets that those of us who want to do science and explore can't even imagine. There is a whole other program of space flight run by the military yeah. that we barely are able to report on. Every now and then we get glimpses of some of the launches and some of the landings and we hear about some of the missions. There's space planes, all kinds of things. There's a whole yeah. other program. So so anyway, I mean, that's that always troubles me. I mean, I try to get... I'm very enthusiastic by nature and I try to really temper it with just this kind of recognition of the of the war part of all of this technology. Anyway, so let's let's continue. So so he, you know, builds all these war machines whether he wanted to or whether he was begrudgingly and depending yeah. on how you tell the story, but you know, and then went on to really build all of these these missions. But uh what were sort of the big ones? What were the big real technical leaps forward that that he really worked on? Uh I I really think Saturn V full stop his team developed the heaviest lift rocket that has thus far existed. And looking beyond that, it was his ability to inspire. This is someone that when you go through the historic records, you find pictures of the space stations he designed, the um, work he did with Walt Disney and Disney Studios to try and encourage space exploration, the um, inspiration that he was for the design of the space shuttle, the conversations he had with Kennedy, he knew how to um, manipulate the, the politicians into paying for his space exploration. Um, but he also understood the human side, the, the like I said, the engaging with Walt Disney. He was, Werner von Braun was the person who was behind the formation of Space Camp down at the Huntsville Space and Rocket Center, which really they were kind of formed together at Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, so, so you have this person that over and over wanted to just get people dreaming of space, like him as a child with his telescope and strapping fireworks to his wagon and getting collared by the police and held until his parents came to get him. But then you also have the dichotomy of this is someone descended from royalty who came from the aristocracy, who was uh, a one percenter essentially in Germany before the concept of one percenter existed. And he lived multiple lives and I don't know if we'll ever know which of those was the true one or von Braun. I I love as well that he had he had thought through missions well beyond the kinds of missions that you know he was going to Mars. Yeah, he was going to Mars. He was he was Elon Musking it right. He he had already plotted out what was going to happen after the Apollo program, after the the um there was going to be the the space stations, and then there was going to be missions to asteroids and missions manned missions to Venus if to he orbit. Had died at age sixty five. He was still sharp. He was still running the Apollo technical program. Um, if he hadn't, when he was diagnosed with cancer, if he hadn't died so, I mean, it's 65 isn't young, but it's, you still are like, oh, he could have had another 20 years. 
Yeah. And where where would we be if his leadership, if his savvy, if his ability to sway, and he was one of those rugged Germans with a full head of hair who captivated in in the photos he's arresting. And all of those things are needed to lead. Where could we have gone if we'd kept his leadership? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, there's some great, great uh, overviews, write-ups of some of these missions and some of his mission plans and what he planned to do for Mars and, and further. And a lot of these missions that we still have, uh, the Hubble, Cassini, the, the Voyager program, a lot of these had their genesis in a lot of the mission plans that, that Von Braun and his team had, had come up with and the, the flight hardware and, and things like that. It's quite amazing how long-lasting the, the sort of his developments had gone even till now. And, and Elon Musk, who's a South African developing for the U.S. and the world's space programs from his headquarters out in California, um, he sent his engineers to basically crawl around the remaining Apollos and learn everything they could because a lot of the plans from the Apollos have just been misplaced over the years. And so we're still trying to learn as much as we can from this leader of the early American space program, of the German missile program. Um, it's a complicated story. Yeah. Well, I think we're out of time, so thank you very much, Pamela. My pleasure. And ending the recording. Don't go anywhere. Save. That's 340. Yep, I need to renumber the file, but I figured that was easier than relaunching GarageBand. Um, and then export, and then upload, and then we can talk. Uh, so, audience, you don't go anywhere either. Yeah, whatever you do, don't go anywhere. <laughs> there we go, little file that needs renamed. No, seriously, change your name. Oh, oh that file. Yeah. Okay, there it goes. Dropbox is simply having a moment. Safe. We are safe, but for how yes. long? Okay, Guido Bibra says there's a very good BBC part three-part miniseries called Space Race, which depicts the race from the perspectives of Werner von Braun and Sergei Korolev, and was fairly accurately historically and co-produced with German and Russian television stations. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. I am going to go dig that up and watch it. Done. Guido, thank you. Um... Uh, okay, Lance I and TJ says, I would miss the episode where Astronomy Cast honors Werner von Braun. I keep going Werner, Werner. I'm sure it's Werner. Um, the gentleman or entire space program, too. Someone actually said how to pronounce it, but they, their description of how to pronounce it is, I don't know. Guido, you could probably do it. Um, okay. Um, Tatiana Velisevska, Velisevska, I always do this every week. Tatiana. Um, I know Tatiana part. So do you believe that we need three more planets to survive as human species? Have you sort of heard about that, about, about the fact that we just, like, we don't have enough resources on planet Earth for the amount that we're using and that we really need three more planets to kind of fully absorb the impact of human beings? Um, I believe firmly in planned population, um, I mean, the, the global climate meeting this week, they presented models showing that um, while we're looking at improved growing conditions in Canada, northern Russia, um, the mid-latitudes of the globe are pretty expletive. Yeah. And this is going to affect our ability to produce enough food to sustain our global population. Um, I know lots of scientists who've chosen not to have children because they understand those models. And I yeah. think what we need to consider is scaling back rather than scaling up. We are beyond our natural ability yeah. to 
sort of uh, you know the best examples that we are you know we're driving the car the car is going really fast and we're going towards a cliff and we are beyond the ability to put on the brakes so literally now it's all going to come down to technology I mean we're looking at the various solar pan <clears throat> solar technology methods of pulling carbon dioxide out of the air I mean as much yeah. as it as it sucks we've passed all of the chances to do things in the safe way and now we're moving into the ways which are Hail Mary passes we are we don't know how they're going to turn out and and if the technology doesn't kind of slot into place then we're going to start to go through changes in sort of global environment and that and, and the places that it sucks the most are the developing world where all the rest of us got to go through this massive period of industrial growth where we just polluted everything without any regard to what we were doing to the world to the environment because we just didn't understand what we were doing or didn't care yeah um, and well, we now, know now. Now we're we demonstrating now. we don't care. But but now we have a lot of the developing world. They don't get the chance to build the cheap infrastructure that pollutes the tar out of everything. They have to leapfrog without financial aid in a lot of cases straight to clean energies. And they're not going to be able to do that in some cases. So how do you advance? Rich Hayward asks, I wonder what he, Werner von Braun, would think about NASA today. What do you think? What do you think he'd think about NASA today? I, I think he'd be disappointed at the lack of spine. Yeah. I think he he had it all figured out. He had put together a whole series of natural steps that you would take after you went to the moon. That was just like step one of landing humans on another planet. Time to go to Mars. Time to send humans to asteroids. It's, let's get rocking. And, and that all just that all just came apart and it's been 45 years and we haven't been back to the moon right it's not so, been 45 years I'm not that old uh, has it been no because I'm thinking of Soyuz Soyuz yeah. was the year yeah, I was 69 born. you're yes. right you're right it has 45 Dang. years yeah right so so we sh 45 years of like think about it right like mercury like how what three years two years Gemini two years three years the Apollo program up to there's then five the generations between the Apollo astronauts and the children being born this year. Mm -hmm. So there should have been, you know, seventy four an asteroid, you know, um, um, uh, you know, maybe seventy seven a lunar base, eighty five um, human mission to Mars. You know, like this was the plan. And yeah. so he would be devastated to see where we're at now. Now, it's not necessarily possible that that his ideas were in any way realistic. I mean, his Battlestar Galactic, of, you know, gigantic endeavor to go to Mars was would have kind bankrupted the United States. But um, uh, yeah, I think he was he was hoping things were going to continue. But once the political things had been met, the U.S. pulled back from the from the program. So yeah, I think he'd be he'd be bummed. Do you agree? I do agree. Okay. It's I don't want to speak Yeah, I'm just kind of speechless when it comes to this stuff. I it's... know, I know you're too deep in it. Elon Musk, just think Elon Musk. Just well, think about it. so one of the things that I learned last week, sorry, I have a dog opening a door in the corner. One of the things I learned last week is one of the commercial space agencies sold a $150 ticket to be one of the first uh, tourists to go around the moon. And that broke my heart because that's more money than NASA has for all of its education, communication, citizen science stuff. Um, one person spent that money to be a passenger. How much? A hundred and fifty million was the report wow. I got. Wow. Um, Tom Nathy says Von Braun comes across as a pragmatic person, willing to look the other way in order to get what he wanted to do. That sounds pretty right to me. I think, yeah. That he, because he sort of did the same thing with the that he always wanted to go to space and 
and if you were in the rocket business, that was eventually going to take you to space, but you'd have to create some killing machines in the short yeah, term. It, if anyone out there is a computer scientist, you may understand this. It's kind of like when you have a, a client come to you and say, develop software to do this, 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 and, the, and, and you're like, okay, so your customers are going to want these three features. And they're like, no, 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 you don't need to do that. We don't want to pay for that. And so you write your code so it will be very easy to add those three features because you know the moment the code goes live, the customers are going to go insane because X, Y, and Z are missing. And you know the client's going to come to you and go, we really need. And, and so you just build the code with that architected in even if it's not fully implemented. And I think he built rockets with human space flight ready to plug and play. Uh, Nancy Graziano says, she's the uh, moderator of the Facebook Astronomy community. Cast community. Thank you, Nancy, for your ongoing support. We really appreciate it. Uh, who do you think is today's Von Braun, or don't we have one? Elon Musk. Well, Elon Musk is is more of an entrepreneur and more of a kind of a visionary of of like the larger... But plan. if you look at how culture has evolved, I don't think that we can have a pragmatic, sweet-talking the politicians and the Congress and the military into here is where we're going. I, yeah. I don't think we, we have the culture to do it. And I think given the modern socioeconomic situation, Elon Musk is today's answer for how we get things pragmatically completed. So I agree, and then I think the question is, who is the sort of top engineer at SpaceX? Because I'm sure a lot of the a lot of the ideas are coming from from there. But the fact that we don't know his name offhand or her name well, offhand I, tells I think us the right open that I think the open source community has changed. How I don't think there's any one person anymore. And and I think with Warner von Braun, it was one guy taking the credit for 150 people working together. Right. And that gets forgotten. And that's kind of Elon Musk as well. I mean, I guess Elon Musk says, I think we can make a rocket take off and land again and only have to refuel it, f figure out how. And and the team is, is working on it and, and on their way there. I'm, uh, you know... How close they are to that technological uh, advancement is just is mind-bending to me. Right. Um, 2015 heavy lift. Uh, Brent Haynes asks, how and where and how do you do your audio? Is it your mics through your computer? Yes. So, yes. So that's my. I use a, bl a a blue snowball. That, and I use a different blue. Yeah, I use a Yeti, right? No, no, no. no. My Yeti's upstairs. This is, I think, a Snowbird. Okay. Um, and then I have an Icicle USB adapter. These USB condenser mics are the greatest advancement in audio. We have been battling uh, audio issues since we started this podcast, and now the fact now that we can not have to go through a preamp and just go right into the yeah. computer through the USB is just has just taken so much of our misery away. So, if you want to start a podcast, get one of these blue. Microphones. Something. Something blue. Yeah, whatever's in your price range. We are, yeah. they do not pay us any money. We just love the gear. And and between the two of us, we have the Yeti, the Snowbird, and the Snowball. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, no, the Snowball's great. It's just heavy, and it looks kind of like a bomb when I take it through the airport, <laughs> through the airport, so they always want me to take the thing out and show it to them and show them that it's a microphone. So if it had a more I microphone shape, that would probably be better. The Yeti just is, like, you could kill someone with it if you hit it. Yeah. Um, this one's much lighter weight, and it has a little bit better range for when I'm doing audiobooks. Um, Simon Love says, so many alternate timelines to think about with this episode, food for thought. I think that's, that's great, right? That just, like, what if... Uh, von Braun was captured by the Soviets instead of the Americans. What if Germany, uh, had, won the Germany war. had got the nuclear program going and was raining hundreds of nuclear weapons on their enemies? There's no question they would have they would have used it. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Richard Drum says, and get a pop filter. 
Yes, yeah. And and if you have a pop filter and it doesn't always help, what Richard taught me is rotate your microphone relative to your face because I will pop given any opportunity to pop. Actually, I found this snowball doesn't require a pop filter. Yeah. We've got one kind of built in maybe, but I don't pop so badly on this one. So, uh, And Richard agrees. Musk equals Tony Stark. Um, uh, let me see what else we got here. Nothing there. Nothing there. I'm not seeing anything on Twitter. No? Okay. Well, I know we sort of... Um, okay, this is a good point. Yeah, Tom Nathan said someone like Dr. Chang Diaz of Ad Astra. So uh, he, he yeah. was an astronaut and is working on this Vasimir propulsion system, which is a, a new propulsion system and could help uh, missions get to Mars much more quickly. And so absolutely. But... I think of that more, I mean, Von Braun was really, you know, was an integrator. He thought of the whole big picture, and, and Diaz is is focusing on this one propulsion system. So, yeah. It, yeah, it is Musk, isn't it? It is Musk. Musk is the Von Braun of our of our age. Um, maybe scaled composites as well? Um, so there you have s scaled composites was... Um, they won the oh, man, I've, I've lost the name of their engineer, but Virgin Galactic is Richard Branson, yeah. and there I think you have pure entrepreneurialism. Bert Rattan. Bert Rattan. Yeah. And I think Bert Rattan had a good vision when he won the Anasazi X Prize, Ansari X Prize rather, and it got complicated by the we're doing tours and we're going to start selling tickets and the looking beyond the taking off and landing in New Mexico got lost in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, oh, Richard says, I do pop, just at the beginning of the show. Okay. Thanks, Richard. I apologize. Um, all right. I think we're good. There's a few comments. Actually, it was great. Lots of lots of conversation. All right, well, let's wrap things up then. So, Pamela, once again, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to share your brain. Um, uh, for those of you who didn't hear me talk about this before, I want to recommend that you drop whatever you're doing, go to either Google Play or the iOS Store, and download a free game called Space Team. And this game... The way it works is that it's you, you're on your portable device and your friend is on their portable device and you are trying to work together as a space team to, and you're essentially barking orders at the other person. So you're telling them to recombinate the jargonator, to release the prisoners, to um, set the viral fluctor at seven, and the other person has to do these, and you have to sort of, sometimes the, they're on your control panel, sometimes they're on their control panel, and if you get enough of these things right, then you advance to the next level. Then there's like asteroids that you have to dodge, and wormholes that you have to go through, and your control panel starts to fall apart, and there's space goo, and it is so much fun, and you can only play it in the same room, either via Bluetooth or on Wi-Fi. It is hilarious. So, and and if you want to learn real science, um, you can download, and we do charge for this because it's how we support our programs. Um, if you want to help feed Joe, our our ex, our uh, JavaScript ninja, um, download the Earth or Not Earth app. It's available both for Android and for iPhone, and um, you're helping fund the creation of more citizen science projects when you do that. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, let's uh, wrap this up. So thanks again, Pamela. Next, what's next? Uh, uh, the, space? What's next? No. What's next is in three hours. It's the Google Lunar X Prize team hangouts. Uh, we're hopefully going to have someone on from Moon Express. We're not entirely sure. Um, but we're also going to bring in some folks from the Google Lunar X Prize itself to discuss what are the milestones, what are the reach goals, what's involved with, with winning this commercial race to the moon. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela. See you later.